I think I've decided that my very favorite one is that very last kid, like in the high chair. Ah! It's just the word. Because I feel that way two to three times a week, minimum. Where it's just like, I'm done. I'm just, ah, I'm out. Hey, I'm so glad we get to be together today. I say it all the time. I never mean it in a trite way. Very earnestly, very honestly. This is one of my favorite times during the entire week where we can come together, center our hearts around God's word, that we can encourage one another, we can build each other up, we can strengthen each other. I think it's an important moment, so I'm so glad that you're here. We want to say hello to church online. So glad that you're with us. Maybe you're catching up later in the week. We're so glad that you're along for the ride. My prayer every single Sunday when we come together is that these moments are helpful, they're hopeful and their life giving. And I just want to say one more time, because I've got it in my notes right here, and it says, make a big deal about Shay Kendall. Shay, we love you. We love you. It's just been an honor to serve alongside with you. I know I'm totally embarrassing her, and now this is going to be on the interwebs for all time, but um, Shay, your family, we're so proud of you. We love you so much. And uh, we're really sad that you're leaving, but we're so blessed. One of the things I love about our church throughout its very long history is that we've always been a sending church. So we bless you and we release you. More than that, we, we commission you for what your next season has. And so we love you so much. I love that we get to honor people like that. Hey, here's how we're gonna wrap up our time together just like every single week what we do. And I wanna encourage you this week, maybe you're one of those few people that slip out. It's one of the reasons I go slip out because I wanna catch you before you slide out. But uh, no, that doesn't happen. What? We take five minutes, just five minutes. There's even a timer on the, on the screen, a five-minute timer just to connect with the people that we're sitting next to you today. And I want you to be listening to our message together today, kind of with this filter, because we're going to put three questions on the screen. What's God saying to you today? Maybe what's one thing, one scripture, one point, one comment, something that God uses to kind of capture your heart. And then one, what's one next step you can take to walk this out? And then one of the most important things we can do with each other when we gather together like this is we can pray for each other. We can build each other up. We can take care of each other. Kind of the the way that Paul says is we carry each other's burdens, and it's a really important thing that we can do together today. So take it seriously. Like, don't slide out. Like, engage. If it's been a few weeks since you've done it, engage with the people around you. Wave. You just high-fived them so you already know them. Let's take time and connect today. We are in part three of our four-part parenting series called Parenting in the 21st Century. I think it's been a really helpful conversation. I know it's, it's really ministered to me, but the conversation for the last two weeks has really been centered around what does it mean to be healthy? We're talking about being healthy. We started off the conversation with this saying that at first, parent, healthy parenting starts with being a healthy person. We're not gonna find any parent that's an incredible influence on their kids or the people around them, but are an incredibly unhealthy person. Those two things won't happen. If you're unhealthy, there's a capacity limit. There's a ceiling on your ability to influence other people. So how we parent, how we lead kids, starts with being healthy ourselves, if we have influence on others, how effective we're going to be in that role is dependent on health, how healthy we are as an individual. And last week, we talked about respect and influence. That's really what parenting is. That's what leadership is, is having influence on other people. We said it this way, healthy respect and influence are the result of consistent values and behaviors. And that's where I want to pick up the conversation today. Because if you've been a parent for any length of time, or if you're a parent-to-be, or you've worked with kids at any level, you know what's going to happen. Eventually, someone isn't going to live up to an expectation. Eventually, someone's going to break a rule, and you're going to have to discipline 
that kid. Right? That's the conversation. Eventually something's going to happen and you're going to have to bring some discipline. And here's where much of the tension about parenting comes into play. So the question I want to pick at today and talk about is this. How do we discipline our kids in a healthy way? I titled our message today, Healthy Discipline. I want to pray and ask God to be in the middle of our time together this morning. Will you join me? Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful that you're faithful, that you're true, that even when we're inconsistent, you're the very definition of constant. You never change. And so we're not just looking for parenting tips or quick hacks. Lord, we want to hear your heartbeat as parents, as leaders, as adult kids, as teenagers, as young adults. We want to hear your way. So will you speak to us through your word today? We're your people. This is your time. And we pray it in your name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you're like me as you've been raising kids or maybe you have adult kids by now, you've probably had some sentence similar to this said to you at some point in time. You need to do something about your kids. (laughs) That wasn't my best joke today, but I'm glad that landed. Like, that's great. My best joke today is what happens in our home sometimes because they're our kids until one of them gets in trouble. And then it's, you need to do something with your kids. She's not in the room. And usually I'm not the person saying it. Okay, now we can move on. What's the, what's the message? Your kids are out of control and you need to get a handle on their behavior. And if you're like me, here's what you probably said in response. Don't you tell me how to parent my kids, right? You need to do something about your kids. Don't tell me how to discipline my kids. How we discipline our our kids, it's it's so personal. It's almost an off-limits topic, right? Like, it's kind of like there's a fence around the discipline conversation And we don't dare encroach on each other's fences. So let me just say this to diffuse any thoughts about what my agenda is here today. I'm not here to give you a checklist for your kids' discipline. Okay, that's that's up to you. What I want to talk about today is I want to talk about healthy values and how we can have healthy discipline when those values aren't lived out. When our boys were growing up, we actually didn't have a whole lot of rules in our home. We saw families whose kids had a seemingly unending list of rules. And those were the kids that were always getting into trouble. Maybe you knew some of those kids. Maybe you are that kid. (laughs) They're always grounded. They're always on restrictions. They never have their phones. They never have their Xbox. I'm hitting home for some teenagers right now, I know. That's part of our context when it comes to parenting is we have to navigate the way that we grew up. Like, how were we disciplined? How did that happen in our homes? We have to navigate that because that's when we come together and we have our own families. We got to figure out these rules. And so what happens is Beth had a context and I had a context and our contexts were very different when it came to disciplining kids. And we had to figure this out. And I'm sure you've had this in your home as well. My sister and I, 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 I said this phrase a couple weeks ago, and I had a couple people come up and ask me, I have no idea what a latchkey kid is. Who doesn't know what a latchkey kid is? You ever heard that phrase? Okay, a latchkey kid kind of was a phenomenon that happened for kids of the 80s. It, we were the first generation where both parents were working full time. And literally it means we had to let ourselves into the house after school. That's why it's, we're called latchkey kids. We had keys to our house, and we had to let ourselves in. So we're all on the same page, right? So my sister and I kind of were left alone when we were growing up. I mean, from a really young age, like early elementary school, we kind of raised ourselves. Like one of my best friends in our home was our TVs. We each had TVs in our room. We got home from school. We went to our rooms and watched cartoons, and that was kind of the, the end of it. We didn't have a lot of rules in our home. Most of our rules in our home, were they, they were unwritten. Or they were unsaid. We had unstated expectations, and that's where we had a lot of our tension in our home. Beth grew up in a very different kind of family. She had very strict rules. And for the most part, there was little reason as to why 
you had some of those rules. You're very quiet right now, but you've got a look on your face. So I'm just to speak plainly, most of the rules in her home when she was growing up as a kid were designed to protect her dad's reputation. We don't do that because it might look bad for the ministry. When Beth and I were dating, this will blow your minds. We're adults. We're dating. We're engaged. She had a 10 p.m. curfew. 1030, I'm so sorry. We broke it almost every night, so what's the matter? <laughs> That's real life. Her dad lived just a couple blocks. You know where Central Park Elementary School is? Her dad lived right up there. And we knew we were in trouble when he was sitting in the living room with the light on. We knew we were in real trouble when we got home and the light was on and he wasn't there because he was here praying for our souls. <laughs> but here's what happened. Once we became parents, we had to kind of figure out what's healthy and what are our, what are our family rules going to look like? How are we going to parent our kids? Are we going to have... No rules, or are we going to have a lot of rules? Are we going to try and land somewhere in between and compromise, find middle ground? And we had to figure out, like, what was going to be healthy for our family. And eventually, after years and years and years of trial and error, we kind of landed on three family rules. If we were playing Monopoly, our three house rules for our family. Here's our house rules. Number one, we put God first in every area of our life. Number two, honor and respect your mother. And parenthetically, this actually applied to other adults as well. Honor and respect adults. And number three, always tell the truth. Everything about how we were trying to raise our boys were connected to those three family rules because for us, they weren't just rules. They were connected to our values as a family, honor and honesty mattered in our home because those were the two things that could break trust and damage relationship. So we built up and we taught and we disciplined around our values, not just our rules. So it begs the question, how do we know what kind of healthy values we should have, right? That's the question. How do we know what kind of values we should have in order to raise up our kids well, we're called to, to build a healthy foundation for parenting and life. And as Christ followers, as growing disciples of Jesus, it's really actually simple. It's to build a healthy foundation on his ways. That's what health looks like. Parenting, leading, influencing others, being a servant is an expression of that health, of walking this Jesus way out he laid the foundation, and Paul winds up coming in the New Testament and giving us practical applications for this. Jesus called his way, he said it this way, it's the greatest command, and then he gave a new one. This is what we talked about last week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbors as yourself. And then the new command that he gave us right before his crucifixion was to love others just like he loved us. Everything about life and following Jesus, following the Jesus way, is connected to those three lines. It's core, they're the core values for life in Christ. Love God, love others, and then love other people just like Jesus. Paul talked about it as being the law of Christ. Do these things, and in this way, that's how you're going to carry each other's burdens. You're going to love God, you're going to love people, and you're going to love other people just like Jesus loved us. As Christ followers, can I say it this way? Everything in life is an expression of that kind of love. And so many of Paul's writings gives us practical ways to walk this out. Churches that Paul was leading were trying to navigate, what does this Jesus way look like? They'd get it wrong, they'd mess it up, and Paul would bring some correction. So what does he say to us? Not just parents, but every Christ follower a great practical example, we looked at this last week, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love, agape, selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love is 
patient. If there's anything that's going to test parenting, it's patience. (laughs) Especially when our kids are breaking the rules and not living up to values. That's going to really test your patience. There's nothing like parenting that can bring out the worst in us. If we're not starting parenting or leading or relationships or work or school, how we interact with other people from a place of agape love, that's the word, agape, selfless, sacrificial, Jesus' kind of love, then it's going to be nearly impossible to live out what it means to be patient. And Paul doesn't stop there. Like, that would be great, right? Love love is patient. Okay, I'll work on patience. No, he gives us a whole list. So many tangible expressions about what love is and what love isn't. He tells us what Jesus' kind of love, what his brand of love is and what it isn't. Check it out. We'll keep moving in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and love is kind. Same word, agape. Love is patient, love is kind. Here's what it doesn't do. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It isn't proud. It doesn't dishonor others. That's a good line to underline right there. It's not self-seeking. Yeah, I'd underline that too. It's not easily angered. Remember last week we talked about that word, the Greek word for patient, long-suffering, endures a long time. The antonym of that is quick-tempered. It's this word right here, easily angered. Love isn't quick-tempered. It's the opposite of patient. It keeps no record of wrong. Let me just say right there, parents don't keep score. Have a short memory. Love doesn't delight in evil, but here's what it does do. It rejoices with truth. And then he gives us four really great tangible things. It protects. It trusts. It hopes. It perseveres, not just sometimes, every single word. It always, always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? It's almost as if Paul knew we'd struggle with this. That was my best joke for today, and y'all, y'all didn't laugh. (laughs) Y'all laughed at that. Okay. It's as if Paul knew we'd have a hard time figuring this out. Why? Because we're often very self-centered. We don't mean to be, but it's part of our sinful nature. We're self-centered. Jesus' brand of love is not self-focused. It's others-focused. Why can parenting be so difficult at times? Because we can get very, very selfish in our parenting. It's about how we feel. It's about our rules. We feel disrespected or we feel fill in the blank. And the less healthy that we are, the more focused on self we tend to be. Just say that one more time. The less healthy we are, the more focused on self we tend to be. No, it's about my needs and my wants and my preferences Here's the thing. We don't mean for it to happen. None of us start off life or marriage or school or work or parenting wanting to be that kind of person. But with parenting, that's the trap. See, we can too easily build rules around our self-centeredness rather than starting from a place of healthy family values. There's a big difference in those two things. We said it this way early on. Healthy families live out healthy values rather than live under heavy rules. Values change the starting place for discipline. It's a game changer. Here's what happens. Here's what values do. Values build up. They build somebody up and they call people to rise to better where rules press down and call for punishment. It's a big difference. Values build up and call for better. Rules press down and call for punishment. We love our kids. We adore our kids. We want the best for our kids. We want the best for your kids here at church. But here's the thing, and you know how much I love you, right? I say it almost every single week. I love you. Church, have I told you lately I love you? 
Here's the thing. Your kids aren't perfect, and they're going to break the rules. If you thought your kids were perfect, well... Every single one of them, because every single one of us, it's almost like it's some kind of brokenness of humanity. Every single one of us is going to mess up and break the rules. Every kid is going to need discipline. And we, as the parents, we, as the leaders, we, I hate this word, but we, as the influencers, need to decide in advance how we're going to respond. So often, out of our selfishness, we react but we need to learn how to respond. Here's what happened in my parents' home. And you know how much I love my mom and dad, right? We're going to honor them. They worked really hard. They gave us a good home. We had a good, good upbringing. But in my parents' room, in my parents' home, when we broke the rules, it was all about physical punishment. We got spanked. Well, I got spanked. (laughs) A lot. We had our things taken away from us. We got grounded. If we broke something, sometimes things of ours got broken. You paid the price. You paid the price. As much as I love my dad, here's one of the lessons I learned. I learned how to get angry when rules were broken. That's what I learned. In fact, in my parents' home, layering a little bit different of a dynamic, here's what happened in our home. Punishments were decided in advance. Here's the rule. Here's the punishment. Have at it. Let me tell you a story on how that played out one day. Guys, you'll love this story. I just turned 16 and had just gotten my driver's license. Remember that day? Oh, glorious freedom. I was taking the car out for myself the very first time. And what did you do in the early 90s with your car the very first time you got to take it out? You went to the mall. Like, come on. That's what you did. You load up your friends and you go to the mall. But here's what my dad said to me before I left. If anything happens to the car, I'm taking away your license. You can take the car, but if anything happens, no more driving. You lose the privilege. So I picked up my buddies and we headed over to Rosedale. Here's my glorious car that I drove. It's a 1978 Pontiac Grand Le Mans. It looked exactly like that. A burgundy exterior with a bright red velour interior. Kids, you don't know what you're missing, not having velour bench seats. (laughs) It was a glorious car without spot or wrinkle. On the way to the mall, one of those beautiful hubcaps you see there on the screen came off the car. If you've never heard that sound, it just sounds like someone just rolled a tin can down down the street, right? So one of these hubcaps come flying off the car. And we turned around. We went, I mean, we scoured. We were driving to Rosedale. So it was right at the corner of County Road C and Fairview. You know where all the medical buildings are right now in the corner? It happened right there. We went looking. That hubcap is gone. It got sucked into some time-space continuum (laughs) vortex. It was gone. Like we saw it bouncing down the road and veering off to the left. And it was gone. The whole time at the mall, guess what I was doing? Oh, I was sweating. Because I knew what was waiting for me. If anything happens to the car, you're going to lose your privilege. I was sweating. I was dreading going home. I had no idea what happened at the mall. Because all I was thinking about was getting home and having to face my dad. It was a Saturday afternoon. I do, go, I do wind up getting home. My parents were in the room taking a nap, and in the most overly dramatic, gym-like fashion, I know none of you know what that ever looks like, I flung the door open to their bedroom, and I took my driver's license, and I wound up, and I just threw it across the room as hard as I could. And not only that, I just shouted at the top of my lungs, just go ahead and take it. And my dad, like, has no idea what's going on. He's, like, groggily, like, what happened? Are, are you okay? Are you hurt? Did something happen to the car? And I'm just in anguish. I lost a hubcap. Now, I didn't realize it then, but a hubcap was probably a $100 part. I actually found one today on a hubcap website, $40 for a used 1978 Pontiac Grand Le Mans hubcap. 
And I'm sure they did the exact same thing that you just did. And they probably had a really good laugh about it. But the buildup and the tension that was happening in my head and my heart was not healthy. They added a weight. This was completely avoidable if they'd had a different kind of conversation. The other parenting handle that we looked at from Paul last week, he told fathers, don't exasperate, don't frustrate your kids. Why? Because they're going to be weighed down. They're going to be pressed down. They're going to be discouraged. There's a trap in predetermining a punishment to a broken rule. Parents, if at all possible, avoid it as much as you can. Because here's what happens. You get backed into a corner. First, you're on the hook because you actually have to follow through on whatever punishment you said. Because if you don't, if the rule gets broken and you don't follow through, you're actually saying that rule wasn't important to begin with and you're reinforcing behavior. That's one. Two, what's the message you're sending with an, an anticipated punishment? Well, I expect you to fail. In fact, I'm anticipating that it's going to happen. There's no way you won't because I've already thought through what's going to happen when you do, not if you do, when you do. That's not building up or calling to better. That's pressing down, and at best, it's saying, I told you so. I told you this was going to happen. Is that a loving posture? Is that being patient or kind? Of course not. That's bringing behavior down to kind of a lowest common denominator. None of us approach parenting in this way. I can't wait to pile on rules on top of my kids. Or you have the... (laughs) It's why we didn't want to have a list of rules for our home. We wanted to live out healthy, consistent values. Values build up, and they call to better. They're encouraging. I want to encourage you. You can do better. They're a healthy starting place. And listen, it's going to take a lot of work because little kids, they don't get it. Middle schoolers, they don't get it. High schoolers, college students, most of all of us, we don't get it. They build up and they call for better. If we were going to write out our family values, we have a pretty decent place on where we would start as a family. Like if we had a do-over and we got to like take a look at 20 years of parenting experience and go, oh, we know so much better now. There's a really, really simple, healthy place to start. Here's how we would start it. We would have four family values. Number one, we love God. Number two, we love others. Number three, we do our best. And number four, we're going to have fun. We love God, we love others, we're going to do our best, and we're going to have fun. These four things can change. These four values can change how you parent, how you work, how you're a student, how you interact with your spouse, how you interact with your friends. Our goal as parents is actually really clear. It's raising kids up to be healthy adults. We're trying to work ourselves out of a job. We're trying to work ourselves into retirement. They are now self-sufficient, functioning adults. I always loved how grown-ups would say adults. I just like it. I also like this move. (laughs) I don't get to do that because I'm very nearsighted, and now you're just a big blur. But those are good two power moves. Listen to the adults. Our parenting assignment from God is just a little more nuanced than that. Our assignment is to train up and raise healthy Jesus followers. Where better to start than Jesus' commands? That's why we started with love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're building a foundation. And the order matters. We can't start with fun and then try to come back and build up on the others. We know we love God because he first loved us. We put God first because everything else in life flows from that. It almost sounds like a scripture from Matthew chapter 6. Seek the kingdom of God. Well, after you have some fun. Above all else. And live righteously. 
Do life the way God intended, and he will give you everything you need. We put God first in everything because he loved us first. And then we love others. When we do that best, it's an expression of how we love God first. In fact, because Jesus is the source of unconditional, selfless, sacrificial love, we have the ability, a supernatural ability, to love others well. If we try to love people without loving God first, chances are we're going to drift back toward that selfish side of the spectrum. Love is how we honor other people. We just read in 1 Corinthians 13, love, agape love, sacrificial, selfless, Jesus kind of love doesn't dishonor, it honors. Logan called me on this a couple years ago. He was running the slides a few weeks ago, a few years ago, and he pulled me aside at lunch. He said, you know, Dad, what you haven't done lately, you know, you always start your message. It's why I was honoring Shay, even though Taylor did that just a few minutes ago, because I always want to honor somebody. Like, I want to build somebody up. He goes, Dad, it's been a few weeks since you've done that. I'm like, oh, they're watching. We do our best. We work hard. We give our best effort as an expression of love. It's a value, not a rule, and the value honors God. It's, again, it's like Scripture tells us to work as unto the Lord. We do our best. We love God. We love others. And we do our best, and then life will be fun. It will be filled with joy. We'll live life to the full. Why? Because we did things in the right order. We did things God's way, not our ways. Values call us to something better. They give us something to aspire to. It gives us something to point our kids at and say, this is the way that we're going. So discipline conversations change. They're not about punishment. They're about encouragement. It's one of my favorite things is speaking life over kids. Even when, no, let me actually say this differently, especially when they get it wrong and they mess it up. We're going to be honest about behavior. You have to be honest about behavior. It doesn't honor your kids if you're dishonest about their behavior. You have to be honest about their behavior, absolutely. But we change how we say things. We say things like, that's not something we do, not because it's a rule, but because it doesn't live up to our values. So how much do we believe in this? We're actually changing our kids' ministry to reflect this very thing. These last few weeks, we actually scrapped all of our classroom rules here at church. We've had a lot of behavior issues so far this fall, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, a lot a lot of behavior issues. We've been talking about this dynamic a lot. One of the best ways for us to partner with your family isn't to lever, leverage a ton of rules on your kids. It's to give them consistent values to live up to. So you want to see our new values as a church as we're trying to lead and serve your kids? You might have heard these just a minute ago. Here they are. We love God, we love people, we do our best, and we have fun. Every time your kids go into class, they're gonna learn these values, every time. We love God, we love people, we do our best, and we have fun. Why? Because we wanna call your kids to better and we wanna speak life over them. We never want church to feel like it's a weight. Oh, I'm getting talked to again. I broke all the class rules again. I was running in the halls again. I was being disrespectful again. Listen, behavior, can I just tell you this? Your kids aren't perfect and mine aren't either. Um, behavior and discipline conversations will still happen. They have to. But they're going to start from a positive place of speaking life and calling kids up to values. Instead of saying to any of our kids, you broke the rule and now you're in trouble, that's what happened to us all the time. This back wall before there were doors in the auditorium, that was the end of the building, and we would get in trouble and Beth's dad would like sit us down against the wall, don't move, you're in trouble, don't move. Kids. Yeah, 10 of us, 15 of us, some of us it was every single week. 
Instead of saying to a kid, you broke the rule and you're in trouble, can we say to them instead, do you think hitting your friend lives out or how we show other people that we love them? Is that showing your friend that you love them? Is that doing our best? Or do you think disrespecting your teacher honors God and honors them? It changes the dynamic. It's subtle, but it's a different kind of dynamic. That's the important part about discipline and values. Yeah, listen, when kids are younger, we should expect obedience because we say. But what's the root behind that? Not do what I say. I'm trying to instill values in you. You just don't know that I'm trying to instill values in you. I'm trying to help you be safe. They don't understand that. But as they get older, we want them to under, under, understand the why behind the value. Discipline, discipleship, that's the whole process. It's owning the why behind the value for ourselves. In our family, there were three ways to break the family rules. And they were all dis words. Dishonor or disrespect, dishonesty, and disobedience. It was pretty simple. If you were dishonest, you broke one of the rules. If you were disobedient, yeah, you broke one of the rules. If you dishonored or disrespected, you broke one of the rules. But they weren't just rules. They were all connected to values. Did we get it right? Of course we did. No, of course we didn't. Come on. It's like a little half second of, oh, really? <laughs> of course we didn't. But it helped us, the values helped us give our kids something to aspire to. Actually, more important, it gave us as parents something to aspire to. Because we're trying to be healthy people first. It changed the atmosphere in our home. Rather than having an atmosphere where everyone was trying to skirt around the rules or having secrecy to avoid punishment or trying to learn where the behavior line is and how we're going to get away with things, it gave everyone freedom, all of the freedom in the, in the world when values got lived out. Listen, we should expect disobedience, dishonor, and disrespect. Like We should expect those things. It's part of the growing process. It's going to happen. Rather than pre predetermined punishments, predetermined discipline. No, no, that's not what we do because we actually value this. No, we don't, we don't skip out on school or we don't skip out on church. No, we do our best. We love God first. No, we don't treat people that way. Not because it's the rule, but because we love others. Because Jesus loved us first. There's a reason behind all of the why. Call your kids up to better values. Don't train them how to just avoid punishment. Intentionally teach them the why. Take the time to explain it to them. And avoid at all costs. Can I just give you one parenting tip today? Avoid at all costs saying anything like, because I said so. Avoid it at all costs. Honesty honors them. Tell them the why. Be honest with them. Honesty honors them. You expect it from them and you can demonstrate it to them first. One more practical handle from Paul to wrap it up today. Yep, or just one more thing? Well, you're getting it anyways. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Famous parenting verses we all know. First, Paul addresses kids. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord for it's the right thing to do. So there it is. We're going to honor our parents and we're going to be obedient. Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you'll have a long life on earth. Another translation says, and you will be blessed. And he doesn't leave it off. Parents, verse four, here it is again. Don't provoke your children to anger by the ways you treat them. Rather, bring them up, call them to better, instill values in them with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Why is discipline so hard? I think at its very core, it's because there's a broken relationship there. Values weren't lived up to, or at worst, the rules weren't followed, and now there's a break in the relationship. I think that's why we can get so reactive with our kids. Dads, I think it's why we can get so easily into a place where we're gonna blow up at our kids because of disrespect or dishonor. 
in our home, one of the hardest things for us was dishonesty because it broke trust. Well, you said this and that wasn't true. Now, how do we know anything else that you're telling us is true? That's a hard place for everybody to live. This takes a lot of work. I hate to say it. It's going to take work and practice and patience. And it takes a lot of consistency to walk out healthy values. And you know whose responsibility that is? Yours. That's our responsibility as parents. But when you do, I make you one guarantee. If you do, if you make the effort to be healthy first and then to live out a set of Jesus-centered values and then parent your kids from that place of health and that place from values, not only will the behavior and discipline be different in your home, I believe the spiritual climate will be completely different in your home. Because the starting place isn't rules, it's values. We love God because he loved us first. We love others because God loves everyone. We do our best because that honors God and others. And we have fun because God gives us joy and abundant life. Can I call you to better? Live out values, not rules. Let me pray with you this morning as we wrap up. Lord, we love you. What a privilege it is for us as parents, as grandparents, as aunts, as uncles, cousins, caregivers, Maybe we are helping raise somebody else's kids. Maybe we've chosen to raise somebody's kids. Maybe we're parents in waiting. Maybe we're not yet parents, but living out a healthy set of values is still an important part of life. No matter what our sphere of influence looks like, Lord, starting with a place of healthy, Jesus-centered values, we know is gonna be a complete game changer than living out a set of rules rather than living out a gotcha kind of culture where we're just trying to avoid getting caught, getting busted. Lord, as we learn how to live out what it looks like to love you and love others well and do our best, be filled with joy, I think you change everything. So it's a moment right now for us to be humble. We humble ourselves. Commit ourselves to doing things your way, not being selfish and always trying to do things our way. So we let you lead and we follow. We're your people. As we all continue to pray in this atmosphere, I think one of the most important verses in the whole of Scripture tells us that Jesus died for us. He paid the penalty for sin for us long before we ever deserved it. Actually, Paul wrote in Romans that while we were still sinners, while we were still yet in the middle of all of our problems, Jesus came at the exact right time to save us. And we call that the good news. Humanity has a sin, has a sin problem. It's a disease. Right to our very core, every single one of us. And there's only one thing that could ever change that, and that's Jesus. Who was Jesus? He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. Tempted in every way, yet never sinned. He never caved. He never walked out what it meant to be selfish or self-centered. He was others-focused all of the time. And he was completely truth and completely grace. And he went to a cross to save you. He saved me, all of us. The whole of humanity, past, present, and future sins are bought and paid for because of Jesus. This relationship with Jesus is possible through one simple thing. It's called faith. How do we know we're saved? Scripture tells us that when we believe and we confess with our mouths, we say, yes, Jesus, I believe you died for me. And we just want to take an opportunity. We never want to leave this place without giving an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If there's anyone here and you want to say yes to Jesus, maybe it's a first time, maybe you're recommitting your life to Jesus. No one's looking around. Just slip your hand up so I can see. Say yes to Jesus this morning. Is there anyone? That's awesome. Jesus, we're yours. We love you. We're committed to doing things your way. Bless these awesome people and these amazing families in your name. Everyone said amen. Hey, I love you, church fam.